In the mid to late 1990s, I was involved in campaigning against uh, GMOs, uh, even to the extent of going out and destroying them in test fields, um, uh, doing an office occupation of Monsanto. We even at one point tried to steal Dolly the sheep. Um, so I was determined at that time with my colleagues to try and eliminate this technology from the face of the earth, as it were. Um, I've more latterly, through working on climate change and becoming close with the scientific community, realized that that was not based on any, uh, any scientific evidence. And um, so I've sort of reversed my position and I now campaign to increase the science literacy with which people view the GMO debate. So was that turnaround? Was that 20 years ago? Well, no, the turnaround was more recent than that, to be honest. I started first having doubts in about 2008, but um, the kind of my public outing was in 2013 when I made a speech for the Oxford Farming Conference making an apology for having earlier campaign against GMOs, and that was what brought me the kind of international visibility, led to me writing the book, and in some ways brings me here today. Well, since 2013, how have you seen the industry moving? No regrets about your change of position? I'm mostly interested in the, how GMOs can be used in philanthropically in developing countries and in the public sector. So I do a lot of work in Africa with policymakers and with journalists over there um, so that some of the poorest people in the world can get access to technologies to improve their livelihoods in the farm. Um, I'm also interested in sustainability, agricultural sustainability overall. So I'm not particularly concerned about what decisions the industry is making in different places, but I think it is important that farmers have access to seeds and to technologies which can make farming more sustainable. So I'm talking about using less chemicals, increasing productivity and using less land because ultimately this, we need to feed a growing world population at, at the least cost that we can to the global environment. <music> Well, the positives for GMOs are that you can use lots of different genetics to, to confer different traits which are of interest to farmers and hopefully can make farming um, less damaging to the environment. You know, I'm keen on nitrogen use efficiency so that farmers can use less fertilizer. I'm keen on insect resistance so that you can spray less insecticide. And, you know, there's been meta studies now around the world that uh, show that insecticide applications have declined by 30 to 40 percent now on GMO as opposed to non-GMO crops and for me that's something to celebrate as an environmentalist and I think more people around the world need to understand that these technologies can be used in different ways and that there's no sort of single answer and you, you can't make a sort of a abstract decision about whether they're good or they're bad. You have to look at each trait in each case on a case-by-case on -case basis. But how are the agricultural industry leaders arguing the case? Are they arguing the right way? Most of the time I think that uh, agricultural industry leaders do not make a good case, partly because they're agricultural industry leaders and so the general public sees them as being interested parties, not surprisingly, particularly if they're agrochemical companies. So we need to reduce, continue to reduce agrochemical use, we need to work on fertilizers, pesticides, we need to work on water, we need to work on land use, all of these things will be very familiar to you. But on all of these things, genetic modification can be a tool for positive change. For me so, as a science communicator, I've tried to come at this and say, look, I'm an independent um, analyst. Um, I'm interested in environmental sustainability. I'm interested in reducing poverty. And I still see these GMOs as useful. Where then should the leadership come from? I think the leadership, I mean, particularly here in Australia, should come from the farming community. I think farmers are still respected um, and they're seen as people who understand what they're talking about because they're actually, you know, in daily contact with the soil and, uh, you know, with the, the needs that you have to, to secure food, whether it's live, livestock or grains farming or whatever else. And people will listen to what farmers say, particularly if they've got generations of family farmers and, and they, they can explain, say, right, this is how we need to protect the crop. This is why we sometimes use chemicals. This is why this GMO trait might be useful to us. So for me, it's, it's you know, rural farm leaders who need to be out there making the case for why their farmers should, should be allowed to adopt technologies. herbicide tolerance, um, even though it, it's been good for no-till, so there's been less ploughing and it protects soil from erosion, which is certainly important where you've got fairly arid conditions like you do in a lot of Australia. Um, that's been a benefit. Um, I think consumers are not keen on herbicide tolerance as a trait. They don't like to think that there's Roundup been sprayed on their cornflakes, you know, so that's a very difficult communications challenge. 
Um, I think insect resistance in cotton has been a, has been a real boon. Certainly reduced insecticide applications and that's been beneficial to, to the wider farmland ecology. So on balance, I think the GMO experience here in Australia as around the world has been positive, but it's very narrow and we're only talking about two crops and just a couple of traits. It should have been much wider and part of the reason why it's not is because the anti-GMO <laughs> movement has been so successful in, in demonising it. What are the consequences if Australia doesn't continue to develop and use GM crops? Well, like Australia, like the rest of the world, has the basic challenge of improving productivity while trying to protect land and landscapes and ecology. And you can't do that if you just remain the same. I mean, uh, is Australian agriculture 100% perfect right now? I don't think anyone would argue that it is, at least of all farmers. And so if you want to see improvements, then you've got to be allowed to use crop genetics and, and, and crop biology as a part of that path to improvement. But let's keep the end objectives in mind. You know, it's reducing agrochemical use. It's uh, to promote no-till further so that you can retain water and, and, and improve the quality of soils. Uh, improve biodiversity as well by cultivating, you know, not ploughing up more um, not more natural landscapes, while at the same time improving the uh, well, increasing the overall amount of food that's produced by farmers. Well, the negatives are mostly in terms of public perception. I mean, the, the science is quite clear that um, the, the health impacts of GMOs are non-existent as compared to conventional foods, and that that's just a non-issue, and we shouldn't be talking about it. It's a waste of time. But obviously there's different impacts from different traits. I mean, herbicide tolerance is a very different trait to insect resistance, which is a very different trait to disease resistance or drought tolerance or anything else. So to, to have a single conversation about GMOs actually is, uh, is, is, is nonsensical. Um, we're talking about crops and farming overall and uh, how, how genetic technologies can be one part of a more sustainable system. As a science communicator, what do you hope people will be taking away from the message you deliver while you're here in Australia? I think you've just got to be consistent um, about how you look at science. Um, uh, there's lots of places in science where there are genuine debates going on, you know, human origins or something like that, or climate change, or, you know, the science of vaccines, and, and it's not among them. Those things are very clear. We know evolution is real, we know climate change is real, we know vaccinations work. So those are politicised debates that we should be moving away from, and people need to be less selective and less politically and ideologically polarised, I think, in terms of how we, how we move forward with some of these issues. Mark Linus, thanks for talking with The Anvil. Thank you.